Uh, th thank you, Charlie. So uh, Lee gave a very nice introduction of, of Charlie. Uh, personally, um, I think Charlie, to, to sum it up, is really one of the giants of medicine who has pushed the edges of uh, heart failure management and transplantation in children. He's also, I, I think, an incredibly magnanimous guy. And it's because he's willing to listen to little people like me that we have been able to take what, what were originally kind of crazy ideas uh, from the lab in studies of mice uh, to, the, to the bedside. So let me tell you a, a number of things in addition to what Charlie said about pediatric heart failure. A child born now with a, a terrible heart defect st actually stands a pretty good chance of surviving to adulthood. These are lesions that even 20 years ago w would have been lethal. And because of advances in the technology in cardiology and cardiac surgery, um, there are more adults now who, who have congenital heart disease than there are children. The problem is that about 10% of them have serious heart disease, uh, have serious heart disease, and many of them are at very high risk for um, heart failure. So what heart failure is, is an inability of the muscular pump of the heart to, to meet the demands of the body. The pump is too weak. And for a number of reasons that I, that I won't get into, it's highly unlikely that there are going to be any breakthroughs, I think, from adult medicine and adult cardiology that will translate to improving outcomes for pediatric heart failure. And what this curve shows is, and it's an important, important type of graph to, um, to understand, is this is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. So what it shows is the probability of survival up to some number of years. And through the decades, in adult medicine, there have been um, drugs discovered like um, captopril, um, beta blockers, drugs that were thought to lower blood pressure that have generally improved outcomes. But still, even uh, a decade ago, the chance, once you were diagnosed with um, heart failure, was uh, essentially a coin toss at four years that you would be alive. And you would not you'll notice that through the decades, for both men and women on the bottom, that um, the progress has been fairly incremental. So I spend most of my time running with Paul Hrues running a basic research lab. And what we're interested in, and certainly the holy grail uh, in cardiology in general, is are to find alternative pathways in addition to the ones that drugs currently target that might um, prevent a healthy heart from going, turning into a failing heart. So what you see at the top is a picture of a, of a normal mouse heart. Uh, this is the left ventricle, which pumps blood to the body. Um, it's relatively small. The muscle is relatively, um, is, is thick or normal sized. When there's a pathologic insult, whether it's genetic or environmental, say, say you have, eat too many cheeseburgers and have a heart attack, um, the healthy heart has a number of maladaptive processes that eventually turn it into a big dilated sac uh, that you see in this corner. And so um, there are a number of drugs uh, that basically block the neurohormonal response of the failing heart. Um, and prevent the progression of disease, but does, does not cure it. And so what we want to find are new drugs or new, uh, new modalities. And the way we start is in a laboratory model. So I show you the same heart. This is a mouse model that develops heart failure in a way that's, in all respects, very similar to what goes on in human beings. They have the same clinical characteristics, symptoms, and when we do molecular biology, they have the same molecular profile. Um, these are common uh, clinical measurements of how well the heart is functioning. So you can see here that the normal heart, this is non-transgenic, becomes really big. And so we can do echocardiograms where the mice over time, uh, the, the normal mice are the open circles and the, the sick mice are the black circles or squares. You will see that the heart becomes more dilated. Uh, this, it's interesting to think about, but this is actually in millimeters. So you know, we're talking about a pea-sized mouse heart. Um, the fractional shortening, how well the, the heart is squeezing, um, declines over time. And these mice at about 10 weeks of age, they basically, their hearts basically stop squeezing, and so they die of congestive heart failure. The mice behave uh, just like humans. When we give them drugs uh, that are used to prolong life in humans, beings with heart failure uh, also extend life. So the solid line here shows in the male population, you know, about half of them die at roughly 80 days of age, and we can extend life a week or more giving standard drugs, and the same is true for females. So it's known that as the heart fail, fails, there are a number of important metabolic changes that go on. Normally, the heart uses uh, glucose and fat 
to, uh, as energy sources for generating um, the mechanical force that, that pumps the blood. As the heart fails, there are a number of changes that go on. First, um, the heart tries to uh, increase the amount of glucose um, that goes into the muscle. Glucose is sugar. Um, the conventional textbook explanation for why that happens is that you get more bang for the buck, more energy from a single molecule of sugar than from fat. And I'll show you some uh, evidence that changes that paradigm, I think, a little bit. What, what's also been uh, noticed, and what Charlie alludes to in the adult literature, is that insulin resistance develops uh, in parallel with the progression of heart failure in these animals. So after you eat a meal, you, you get a, a, a bolus of glucose and fat into your blood. The, uh, the glucose sends a signal to the pancreas. The pancreas releases insulin, which is a hormone that tells the body that there's glucose in the blood to use. And this insulin tells the cells to start sucking in the glucose. What happens in heart failure is that for some reason, the body cannot sense the insulin anymore. And so uh, the glucose levels in the blood uh, become elevated. They're not getting sucked into the cells. Paul Hughes, who's in the audience over there, is a pediatric endocrinologist. And I should point out that you know, this is one of the great things about working in St. Louis and at Washington University, how collaborative it is, and how people from really very different fields come together, put their heads together to solve um, problems in ways that you would not have uh, thought of. So he had discovered several years ago that patients who take a, a certain class of drugs um, that treat AIDS develop what looks like diabetes. And it's probably because these drugs, which are called HIV protease inhibitors, uh, block the transport of glucose into cells in the body. Um, this is transport that's insulin dependent. Um, so when I came here, uh, I, I think Paul was looking for ways to apply th this basically drug to, to figure out glucose physiology, not related to AIDS or diabetes, but just in general. Uh, at the time, I knew that glucose was somehow important uh, in the heart. And so what we did is we, did, we just gave the, um, the, the drug to animals to see what would happen. So if you give protease inhibitors to normal mice, they appear fine. On the other hand, if you give protease inhibitors to the um, sick mice, the effect is very dramatic. So they develop severe hyperglycemia, that, which means that um, they already have elevated glucose levels in their blood from their heart failure, but then it gets really high. What's really very interesting and turns the textbook um, thinking around is that these mice, when you block glucose transport into their heart, their heart becomes small and stiff, like stiff as a rock. And it becomes so stiff that they, they can't fill for the next beat. So that's what diastolic dysfunction means. And, and the blood starts backing up into the lungs and into the body, and they die within an hour, uh, usually, um, from this congestion. Uh, when we do echocardiograms on these mice, it appears, at least grossly, that the hearts are still able to squeeze. So there's still some energy going into the heart, but they can't relax. So that's distinctly different, um, a distinctly different process in the heart. Both are important, squeezing and relaxation. So th this is where the leaps come in. We ha if blocking glucose transport into the heart is bad, would increasing glucose transport into the heart be good? There are some drugs uh, used to treat diabetes that sensitize the body to the effects of insulin. So if you give this drug for any given level of insulin in the body, more glucose will be taken into the cells. When we gave these drugs uh, to the mice, uh, the, the level of hyperglycemia, the, the, basically a, a sign of diabetes in the blood, um, fell. So it didn't become normal, but it, it got better. So that's good. We can do experiments where we measure the amount of glucose going into the heart, and it was quite clear that these animals could increase glucose uptake into the heart. This work was done by Arpita Vias, uh, an endocrinology fellow in Paul.